memorize. We're in a series uh, called um, Calling, where we're looking at lives interrupted in Scripture. These are like biographical sketches of some of the amazing figures in Christian history. And today we're going to be, uh, or in biblical history rather, today we're going to be in the Old Testament. We're going to be in the book of Jonah. Now you might be thinking, I've heard this story already. I already know this. I've got it down. Every time I read the book, I find new and more and more amazing and more interesting features, and I hope you'll find many of those same things today. As we begin, though, I want to draw your attention to the prospect of teaching a teenager how to drive a car. Some of you have experienced that, right? If you need a boost in your prayer life, I recommend giving it a try. It's a, it's a real trial of faith. I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine you get in a car with your teenager for the first time. The two of you are looking at one another, and you're rolling through just a bunch of the how-tos and things you need to know and things you need to be aware of. And you're talking about defensive drive, and your teenager seems to be on track with you, and they're like nodding their head. And they're like, you know, I do have one question, though. And here, here's the question. How many times do you need to steer a car? Do you need to steer a car four times? Should I be prepared to steer a car 72 times or maybe 490 times? How many times do I have to steer a car? Do the best kind of drivers steer just once? Do they just set the direction and then press the gas and just then hit the brake when they arrive at their destination? Now, most of us recognize you can't answer that question with an exact number. At least if you have a license, I really hope you recognize that. The issue is, is not one of number. It's not that there is a set number of times that you're going to steer a car. Hopefully, all of you who drive recognize that what is transpiring as you steer a car is really a relationship. It's a relationship between you and a whole series of obstacles and directives and objectives that you're moving through and past. And not all of them are static, right? Some of these things are moving and they require that you be on your toes. It's not enough that you steer your car three times and then you're where you need to be. What's true of steering is true of God's calling. How many times can a person be called by God? One time? If you listen to most theologians, they'll describe the calling as a one-time ordeal. I remember when I was first called by God. It was a one-time thing that happened, and now I'm operating completely within that call. But how many times is God willing to call you, or call you away, or call you to? I don't know about you. When I was baptized, I didn't get the full story of my whole experience serving God. God did not say to me, when I came up out of the water at eight years old, you will be a teacher and you will eventually be a preacher. Did you get the call? Did you, were you told everything that you were going to do for the kingdom of God when you first made that decision to follow him? I wasn't. God's call may change. God's call may come to you at different times and maneuver you in different directions. But you know how people feel about change, don't you? Doesn't everyone just love to change? It said that the only entities that like change are babies, and even they cry through the whole process. This week's calling does not come to someone who doesn't know God. This week's calling comes to someone who is already a prophet when they receive the call. And this call is met with bitterness, the same kind of bitterness that many of us feel when God tries to grant our enemies the same mercy that he showed to us. This week, we're going to examine the calling and the recalling and the re-recalling and perhaps even the re-re-recalling of Jonah. Let's begin, though, with a word of prayer. Our Lord and our God, I praise you for the mystery of your word. Thank you so much for all that you hide here for us to unravel and unravel and dig up and discover and understand. God, this is a uh, story that is familiar to most people who are in this room. I want to ask today, Lord, that again, as we read through this text, that your Holy Spirit would bring to light a new understanding of all that you have set within your word. Speak to us, O oh Lord. Speak to the inner person, and I pray again, Father, that we don't just hear and learn more today, but that we apply more, that we become different people because of what we're hearing from you. We love you, O oh God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to start today by talking about a calling interrupted. Secondarily, we're going to talk about disobedience and deliverance. And lastly, we're going to talk about the resurrected prophet. Uh, Do you like GPS devices? 
Do you enjoy the phrase recalculating? <laughs> that whole idea, that, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, there are some times when you are so off course that the only thing the GPS can say to you is, make a U-turn, right? Uh, it's, it's not so much that you're just wrong, but you're so wrong that I can't continue in the path you are. You've got to turn around and move back to another place so we can get on track again. The calling of Jonah comes to him when he is already a prophet. In other words, life is already well underway for Jonah when this calling comes. To put this in television terms, Jonah is already at work doing something. We now return you to your regularly scheduled program already in progress. Jonah's about the business of God already before verse 1 of chapter 1 actually begins. He's a minister. He is a prophet. He's already had an in-depth relationship with God where he has made pledges to God. He's vowed things to God and he's serving the Lord when verse one begins. Now we don't know much about the ministry of Jonah prior to verse one of the book of Jonah, but we do get a brief mention of it in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. It says this, he, that is Jeroboam the second, restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of Gath-hefer. Now, Jeroboam II was a wicked king. He was a very bad king. But Jonah was a prophet in Israel, and Jonah spoke this prophecy about Jeroboam's military success. He said, look, you're going to do well. You're going to conquer all of these territories. And so it was, which means Jonah was an accurate prophet. Later on, another prophet named Amos, you might have heard of, came along and said, by the way, Jeroboam, you've conquered territories. God's going to take all those territories away from you. And so Jonah's message is in direct contrast to Amos's message, but both are fulfilled. Jeroboam II conquers a vast quantity of territory, and then Amos comes along and says, God's going to take it away, and God does. Now, what do we learn from this? We learn that Jonah is God's servant already. We learn that Jonah is not a figment of people's imagination. He is not a made-up character. Jonah was a real figure in history who did very real things and was literally swallowed by a great creature in the deep. We also learn that Jonah was a prophet giving accurate prophecy when this calling of God arrives. Before verse 1, Jonah is already entrenched in relationship with God. Now here's a question we're going to ask, and you've probably asked it yourself if you've ever read the book of Jonah. Is Jonah a jerk? I read over this book and I look at this guy's character and I think to myself, man, this guy's kind of a punk. And really, when you read theologians, you'll often find a number of theologians saying things along the, these lines, that Jonah is personally a lesson in failures, that ultimately Jonah is a demonstration that God can and will use anyone, in fact, perhaps even a damned human being, somebody who is headed toward hell, that God can use such a person to accomplish his will. The Bible Project, which I usually like, I like a lot of their material, they absolutely ridicule Jonah as a, mean, as a mean-spirited individual. They even go so far as to say the whole book really comes across as satire. That bastion of theological insight that is Veggie Tales uh, seems to hold that the Jonah is scum position. Like Jonah is a jerk. In fact, they set it forth in song. Jonah was a prophet, ooh, ooh, but he never really got it. Sad but true. And I was very pleased to see some of you mouthing those words. <laughs> For now, here's what I want you to do. Whatever you think of this prophet, I want you to reserve judgment about who this man is. And I want you to do your best as we go through this text and examine the life of Jonah to empathize with him. I want you to try to feel what it feels like to be Jonah in this moment, experiencing the call that Jonah is about to receive. Jonah's first calling is a calling to Israel. His, he's ministering to Israel. He's ministering to kings in the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom. So the call that you're about to see is not a calling. The call that you're about to see is a recalling. It is a secondary calling, at least. He's being called away from his language and from his culture, from a place where he is at minimum respected as a legitimate voice for God. And I want you to think about this question as we get started. Where do you not want to go? What place do you not want to be on planet Earth? Um, I've often said to friends who serve as missionaries in tropical climates, 
If the Lord wanted me to go to India or Vietnam, I think I would need a divine manifestation to tell me that. I cannot stand hot and humidity. I could go to Siberia and I'd be cool. I'd probably still be wearing shorts. But I I, I wouldn't want to go there. God would have to come and speak to me, I think, in person to drive me to do something like that. Where do you not want to go? Is it Pittsburgh? Is that the place you are unwilling to stand for God? In, in this time period, in history, in, in when Jonah's era, if you asked anybody in the Mediterranean, where is the one place you do not want to be? Probably everyone would have said Assyria. Do not send me to Assyria. I do not want to be in and among those people. God's call to Jonah in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, is for him to go to hell on earth and offend its occupants. Look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. It is the very hub of Assyria, and Assyria is terrifying. My Old Testament history professor, uh, who I dearly love, described it this way. He said, when Babylon finally conquered the Assyrians and threw down the Assyrian empire, the whole of the Middle East breathed a sigh of relief. Everybody hated Assyria. Now, you're going to have to allow me to get a bit gory here for a few moments because you need to understand the context that Jonah's being called into you. If it bothers you to hear this, and I will tell you that for some of you, you will be bothered by hearing what I'm about to say. I want you to imagine what it feels like to be Jonah and be told by God, this is the people I'm sending you to go minister to. When the Assyrians conquered a territory, their standard procedure for breaking the spirit of those who were carted off into slavery went a little something like this. They would first of all go in and capture the city, and they'd take everybody who was of repute, individuals who were of prominence, and they would skin those people alive. Then they would take their skins and the carcasses of those individuals, and they would hang them all over the city walls in public view so that everybody could see their leaders having been skinned alive. They would then take wooden stakes, think wooden posts, slightly sharpened, and they would take every man of fighting age. And this is from 14-year-old boys on up to the 50-year-olds, and they would take them outside of the city and they would dig a whole bunch of post holes and they would lift up those posts and they would impale those young men underneath the rib cage or through their rectum and they would leave them hanging on that post dying. They did this to adorn the roads out of town because they wanted everyone being carted off into slavery to see the people they love and respected writhing on poles as they died. They would then line up the slaves who were shaved head to toe usually And they would take their elbows and they would push them together behind your back. I don't know if you want to try that or not. I can't make my elbows touch behind my back. But if there were two guys my size standing on either side shoving my elbows, whether through dislocated shoulder or otherwise, my elbows probably could touch behind my back. And then they would bind their elbows together with a cord behind their back. They would then take a hook and they'd put it in the nose of one individual with a line that ran to the rectum of the individual in front of you with a hook piercing that area. And that's how you would be lined up. They'd then tie a cord to the the cord binding your elbows behind your back, and that would run up to a pole that was above you. And it would be tied off there so that a soldier standing on either side of the pole as this long pole ran from slave to slave, and they were all bound to it, could just lift up the pole to put pressure on your elbows and your shoulders, which were at this time lacking blood and probably dislocated. And they would march you past all of your loved ones on post as you headed out of town to break you as a human being. But surely it got better once you got into slavery in Assyria, right? Wrong. You especially did not want to be a woman in Assyrian culture. Here's some ancient texts that describe what transpired in Assyria during this time period. These are Akkadian translations of legal codes that were put together under the rule of Tiglath-Pileser I, a king of Assyria. This is a law. If a slave girl has received anything from a married woman, the slave girl's nose and ears are to be cut off so that the theft will be avenged, and the man shall cut off his wife's ears. You hear that? Your wife can't give anything to a slave. Why? Because your wife is property. 
and your slave is property, and everything you have belongs to you. And if somebody does something wrong, mutilate them. Cut off their nose, cut off their ears. There are legal requirements that uh, tell you when you can cut off parts of a person's body, which was a normal form of punishment in the Assyrian culture. There were regulations for when dumping boiling tar over a person's head was allowed. A man was allowed at any point in this culture to beat his wife, to pull out her hair, or to mutilate her whenever he felt that she deserved it. This was the culture that Jonah was being called to. This was a people intensely cruel. It was normative for them. When you look at art in Assyria, you will see depictions of people being flayed alive, and that's how they decorated their houses. Would you be conflicted about going to such a a place? We are great at playing armchair prophet, aren't we? Like you and I will read a text like this and we're like, listen to God, dude, come on. What are you afraid of? Go to Assyria. What would you do in this context? How would you feel about moving into that culture? What reservations might you have if you were Jonah? If I go there, there's a strong likelihood that this cruel culture will put me through torments, the likes I cannot even imagine. If I don't go, what's the difference? God's command is that they're going to be destroyed. God's punishment will fall on them. And good, these people deserve to die. If you're Jonah, what do you say to yourself? Well, if I do speak to them, what if I do talk to them? And in the best case scenario, they turn and begin to repent. What then? Is God going to forgive them? I don't want that. Nobody wants that. Other than obedience to God, what upside is there for Jonah in going to Assyria? Let's talk disobedience and deliverance. When children are first born, they sleep and they cry and they poop their diapers, and we all long for the day when they will begin raising their head and then getting up on all fours and starting to crawl and then walk. And aren't they so cute when they take those first toddling steps, their chubby little legs pumping as they try to keep their center of gravity and not flop on their face. What a wonderful time. But then you spend about the next two years wondering why you were in such a rush getting them onto their feet. Why? Because they're constantly moving and walking and trying to grab things off counters and opening drawers and opening cabinets and opening doors and trying to get away. And sure, their chubby little legs only carry them uh, about five steps for every one of yours, but they get to determine when and where you play the you have to catch me game. You know the you have to catch me game. And sometimes your kids are such that they turn and look at you and they get that mischievous look like, yes, it's about to happen. And then they bolt. And and, and whether or not you want to, you're chasing them down and trying to sweep them up and grab them. And then you you hoist them up and they do that that ninja, you know, I'm going to turn my body into jelly move. You know what I mean? Where they just become dead weight and try to slip out of your hands. Jonah's going to play the you have to catch me game with God. This is planned disobedience. Jonah did not just find himself on a ship away from God's presence. He had to plan this, and he went to carry it out. Look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Underline that if you have your Bibles. From the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship which was going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into, uh, into it to go to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. There's that phrase again, from the presence of the Lord. Now, we've seen this mentality several times in our study of the Old Testament, this notion that gods have regional control, that a god is over a certain region, and that god has power in that certain region, but remove that god from that region or go outside of that region, and that god's ability is somehow diminished. And since Yahweh is the God of Israel, the God of Judah, perhaps, Jonah thinks, if I boogie out of town, he'll just lose track of me and be forced to use somebody else. That's what he attempts. Now, the location he's headed is Tarshish, um, probably modern-day Spain. So God's call to go to Nineveh is, Jonah, I want you to go north and east, north and east, east, (laughs) north and east. And Jonah's response is, I am going to go as far west as I can possibly go. It was probably the furthest that they even knew of in the Middle East as the world. And so that's what he does. He books passage to go by water to Tarshish. Who knew that Jonah was going to disobey? Well, Jonah did, but who else did? God knew. Did the sovereign God know what Jonah would do when he called him? 
Which means this, that it was God's plan from the beginning that Jonah would disobey. Now, let me be careful here. Was it God's desire that Jonah disobey? But did God know that Jonah would disobey? Yes. In fact, God called him knowing that Jonah's path to Assyria first walked into a path of disobedience. And yet God called him anyway. God didn't make Jonah disobey, but God knew that Jonah would disobey. And much like Jesus knew that Peter was going to disobey. And Jesus knew that Judas was going to disobey. Does that mean that he then went, I can't use you? No, instead he looked at the individual and went, I'll use you. And I'll even use this trial that you're about to undergo. I'll make use of it for my kingdom and for my glory. Look at Jonah 1 verse 4. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a great storm in the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. The sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God. In other words, everybody had different gods. And they threw cargo, which was on the ship, into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below deck into the hold of the ship, lain down and fallen sound asleep. Where have we seen in biblical history somebody who was on a boat that was about to be destroyed that fell asleep? Oh, Jesus, that happened to Jesus. Look at verse 6. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you're sleeping? Get up, call upon your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Doesn't this sound familiar to what happened in the boat with Jesus? Get up, don't you know we're about to die? And in this instance, everybody's told, Call on your God. In the instance with Jesus, Jesus just gets up and goes, Shut up, and the whole sea calms down. What kind of God could do that? Same kind that they're about to call on here. Verse 7, each man said to his mate, come, let us cast lots that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell to Jonah. Now, last week we discussed how Gideon, or God encouraged Gideon by showing Gideon that he was sovereign, right? God said, go down into the camp. Listen, I am the God of the dream and I am the God of the dream interpretation. I have absolute control here. Here is Jonah sitting on a ship. And remember, what was he trying to do? Flee from the presence of the Lord. I got to get away from him. And now they're about to cast lots. They're probably about to throw knuckle bones to see who's responsible for all this. And if God is sovereign, who will it fall to? I can just see Jonah glassy-eyed staring as those knuckle bones begin to roll. And everybody's eyes shift up and turn to look at Jonah What was an encouragement to Gideon, God's sovereignty, is going to be a condemnation for Jonah. It's going to be his doom. God is still in control in this place. You ever have to acknowledge a harsh reality? Reality reality sometimes asserts itself. Uh, I I remember, um, and I know this might be difficult to believe, when I was in like high school and early college, I was actually an extraordinarily agile human being. I was involved in martial arts all through high school. I did kung fu and and Thai boxing and and all that fun stuff. And uh, and in my mind, as I was getting fat and gaining tens of tens of pounds, um, I thought to myself, yeah, I'm still that. Uh, I remember I went to a new kung fu school after Lisa and I had been married several years. I put on, I think, 40 pounds in my first year of marriage, just to give you an idea how how content I am. Um, (laughs) But I remember there was a kung fu school I heard about, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go do a little kung fu again. And so I went to this kung fu school, and I was talking to some of the people there, and they're like, what styles were you involved in? And I talked to them about styles, and like, can we see one of your forms? I did one of the forms and everything, and like, you're very agile. I'm like, yeah, I can, I can still drop into the full splits, you know, straddle splits. I used to be able to do that when I was in high school. Well, used to is the key word. Um, I tried to demonstrate it, and I went down, and I started feeling some resistance, and I thought, that isn't right. And so then I just dropped, and I did the full straddle splits, but then I heard a noise that sounded a little something like this. Yeah. And uh, immediate burning pain, and I walked weird for about three weeks afterwards. (laughs) I haven't done that since. (laughs) Reality asserted itself. What I thought was true, what I thought could have been possible, was not. And I got smacked in the face by reality. Jonah is getting smacked in the face by reality. He has been called by God, and now he's had a recalling. I'm going to send you to the Assyrians. And now he's trying to run from God, and now he's going to get a re-recalling. In other words, God's going to say, you now have a different mission. 
Look at chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is a confession of who God is. God's power is acknowledged. Reality is acknowledged. Then they said to him, tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now I notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, I serve the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the land and the sea. Instead, he said, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the land and the sea. Why? Because he knows he is engaged in disobedience right now. And yet he still recognizes who God is. When he said God is the God of the land and the sea, he was on a boat. He was on a boat that was being struck by a storm. This was a confession of reality. God is in control here in the ocean right now. But then he makes a secondary confession. It's a confession of who I am. Look at Jonah 1, verse 10. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How can you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. So he said to them, or they said to him, Why should we, or what should we do to you that the sea might become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. He's confessed who God is. God is the God of land and sea. God is the one who controls everything. But secondarily, now he's made a secondary confession. I am a foul of this God. I have done wrong by this God. And what do I deserve? What does Jonah think he deserves? A death sentence. I'm a rebel. I must be destroyed. Now, here's a question for you, and you might want to write this in your margin. Whose idea was it to throw Jonah in the sea? You might think that was Jonah's idea. Jonah is a prophet, which means sometimes Jonah says things and does things that did not come from him, but come directly from God. And when they ask him, how can we resolve this situation? Did Jonah know throwing me into the sea is going to fix this storm? Or did God say to Jonah, Here's how you can resolve this situation. You have to be in the sea. But not just that. You have to be thrown into the sea. Now, it's interesting. Jonah doesn't lie to them. Jonah does not attempt to deceive these men, nor did Jonah jump into the sea himself. He said, you have to pick me up and you have to throw me in. Why? Because God's saying something far more here than what is at the surface. You see, Jonah's life right now is prophetically telling a very important story. Let's see what is happening in a New Testament parallel. Jonah acknowledges a holy God, a God who controls all things. And then Jonah acknowledges that he is engaged in rebellion against that God. And then Jonah acknowledges that the only right thing is for me to be killed. I should be put to death. But the death sentence he has to undergo will require that actually someone else plunge him into the water. We have another word for plunging people into the water. Baptism. That might be a stretch, Ben. Hang on. Look at Jonah 1.13. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called to the Lord, and they said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us. Have you heard a phrase like that before? In the New Testament context, when Pilate has Jesus on trial, you'll read about this in Matthew 27, verse 24. And they're going back and forth. Pilate's like, look, this man's innocent. I find no fault with this man. Don't hold me accountable for this man's blood because Pilate does not want to be the instrument of this man's death. So he washes his hand of the matter. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Who put Jesus on the cross? There are a number of answers there. I mean, I did, right? Who else did? Okay, that would be all of us, right? But so did the Jewish officials and leaders, and so did the Romans who were there. But Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I freely give it up. Who put Jesus on the cross? Ultimately, it was Jesus by the will of the Father. 
a shedding of innocent blood. Verse 16. If you have your pen with you, get ready. The men feared the Lord greatly. Underline that. Then they offered sacrifice to the Lord. And then they made vows. You know what this means? A bunch of pagan Gentile sailors committed themselves to Yahweh while on this ocean vessel. These men could see that Jonah meant something to God and that God had power over them, that Yahweh was doing something. They didn't want to run afoul of God, and God specifically instructed them, you've got to toss this guy into a watery grave. And eventually they relent and they followed the directives of Jonah. It's interesting that even while Jonah disobeyed God, a missionary trip to a contingent of sailors is in play. I expect that many of these men continue to pay homage to the one God for the rest of their lives. And in fact, we'll probably encounter them in eternity. Isn't that cool? Sort of reminds me of uh, other people being persuaded in the midst of a particular death that God was involved in beginning to worship and pursue that God, like the centurion at the foot of the cross. Surely this man is the son of God. In this death, in the death of Jonah, salvation is extended to what people group? Gentiles. The Gentiles can receive this salvation, even in this this demise of Jonah, even in his wretchedness, salvation is being extended to Gentiles, people like you and me. A death sentence is taking place. Look at verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. A death sentence. Now, this is where skeptics will sometimes say something like this. I cannot believe that anyone would pay attention to this nonsense. Do you really believe that a man survived in the belly of a fish or whale for several days? And the answer to that is, yes, I absolutely do. If it's possible that the God of this universe fashioned the cosmos, and you accept the premise that God has all power and absolute authority, what exactly is the problem here? There are animals that exist like the sperm whale or uh, that swallow deep-sea giant squid whole. Uh, there are other a uh, number of whales like baleen whales that take in huge quantities of, um, of fish in their mouths at one time that could very easily take in an entire human. Or it could be this. It could be that God just generated another creature whole cloth and made it for just this purpose. In fact, the text actually looks like that might be the case. The Lord appointed, which means that God set apart a great fish to swallow Jonah, almost as if God generated one for just this reason. So, no, I don't have any problem with it. And I take it seriously. Let's talk death and resurrection. What's going on with the great fish here? We notice that the fish is appointed, that the fish is set apart for this purpose, but the fish really isn't death. The fish is the resurrection portion of this whole enterprise. Death is what is happening to Jonah in the process. Look at Jonah chapter 2, verse 1 through 9. So Jonah gets swallowed, and then he recounts everything that apparently has happened to him. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish, and he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol, and you heard my voice. For you had, Sheol, by the way, is the grave, if you want to translate that. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with, with its bars was around me forever, but you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. How does Jonah describe his watery condition? Death, the grave. In fact, there are a contingent of theologians who believe that D Jonah was not saved, that Jonah died. And then Jonah was swallowed by a fish, and Jonah was brought back in that condition. When he says that I went down into the bars of the earth, what he's telling you is I went into a watery grave. I was dead. I was a dead man. And in that condition, I cried out to the Lord. And what does he do? He repents. 
Jonah 2, verse 7. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Those people who don't know you, they're not faithful. But look at verse 9. But I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Now look at this passage, and I want you to just read verse 9 once more. I I want you to read it as if reflecting on your own baptism. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. When you were baptized, what did you give to God? What vow did you make? Did you say, I'm committing to go to church? I'm committing to be nice to my friends. Your vow in baptism was, I am dying to myself. This life now belongs to you, O God. The baptism of repentance. Jonah commits to the recalling in this moment. Now, I want you to see what's happening here. Jonah goes into the water. It's death. He's dying to self. And in the midst of that, a repentance takes place. And now God is going to raise him back to life again. Born again, as it were, from the water. Jesus speaks to this issue. Occasionally I'll hear a person claim that it doesn't matter whether or not these things actually happened. You probably heard Bible scholars say something like that. Oh, this could just be a story. It doesn't really matter. I think it matters a great deal. In part because Jesus indicated that this happened. He treats this as though this story is real, a genuine story. He further identifies that this story has tremendous bearing on the generation in which he ministered. Listen to Jesus' words here. Matthew 16, verse 4. He says this, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given to it, except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. We know that Jesus demonstrated a sign of Jonah in his own life, right? I mean, Jesus died. He was buried in the ground, and he was raised to new life. And we're like, yes, I see that clearly. This is Jesus' resurrection. And you might look at that, and you think, okay, well, he was just talking trash with the Pharisees, right? He's like, hey, you want to see a sign? I'm going to raise from the dead. That'll be your sign. But not everyone has seen that sign. Did you get to visualize that? Did you actually experience that with your eyes? Are you in a wicked and adulterous generation? There's another sign that is available to you. It's a sign that is prevalently evident to anyone who is part of a wicked and adulterous generation. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What is the sign of Jonah? Well, there's definitely a sign in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, but then Jesus tells us, you will identify with me, and your death and burial and resurrection comes in the form of baptism. Jonah's story is a foreshadowing of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, but it's also a foreshadowing of what happens for every New Testament Christian who makes a vow to God, is immersed and repents, and comes forth as a new creature to serve him and pay their vows. Let's talk about the resurrected prophet. My two older brothers love to fish off the beach, and nothing seems to gather a crowd as quickly as when that pole bends, and they grab it and begin reeling in their quarry. People come from all over the place. They surround them because it is so fascinating to see what on earth they're about to drag up out of that water, right? People can't wait to see what's on the other end of that line. When God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh, God knows that Jonah is going to disobey. God knows the remedy for Jonah's disobedience. God reveals to Jonah that he's got to go into the water and a death has to happen, and it does. But then God knows how the next phase of life goes for Jonah. Jonah was a prophet with pomp. He had presentation. Man, that's making an entrance. Jonah is the puked up prophet. Look at Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. The Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now, I think that in order for us to understand what happens next, we really have to kind of visualize these events. 
try to understand and make some inferences about what's actually happening here. Let's start by understanding this. Most coastlines in the ancient Mediterranean world were populated. Uh, that is, uh, the sea represented uh, in income because you could engage in trade on the sea. The sea also repre represented food. You could fish on the sea. And so most coastlines were occupied, which means this. When a giant sea creature came swarming up onto land, people would have noticed. Individuals who were plying their trade on the ocean, individuals surrounding the ocean, individuals who were in villages that lined the coastline would have seen and people would have gathered. Have you ever seen something giant on the beach? Do you go look? This is very big. And this is a people group who are fascinated by things that came out of the water. So I want you to imagine you have surrounded a massive sea creature and there it is on the land. At least its mouth portion is up on dry ground and it's eyes might still be moving around and looking at you. And as you're standing there in a big crowd surrounding this thing, a noise, a gurgle comes from within and its mouth opens and everything that was inside of it begins coming out of it. This creature regurgitates its stomach contents onto dry land and there in the midst of that stinking pool of partially digested flotsam is a human being. This man is likely hairless. His skin is probably profoundly bleached and partially worn through by stomach acid along with his clothing. And as you look and are horrified to see a body in that mess, that body stands up and spits out some of what was in the nose and mouth and begins to go down to the water to wash himself. Can you imagine standing around and seeing this happen? And as he's washing himself, everyone's still at a distance. And you're like, who are you and what is happening? I'm a servant of the Most High God, and I'm going to Nineveh to tell them about their destruction. Do you think maybe you'd forget that story? Do you think you'd go home and your wife would be like, how was fishing today? And you'd be like, oh, I didn't catch very much. Oh, wait a minute, something did happen. My guess is you tell that story to everyone that you encounter, probably for the next several weeks. Look at chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to, its, or proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm about to tell you. Now most people who lived on the coastline worshipped a particular deity in this time period known as Dagon. Uh, Dagon, you might remember, is the deity that the Philistines worship preeminently. Dagon is a, a fish god, um, as we, you probably see on the screen behind me. You see the priests in the cloaks with the fish scales on them. Those are priests of Dagon. You know who else worshipped Dagon? The Assyrians. For them, it was one of their highest deities. And so fish were considered to be a sacred thing. And what do we have as an entrance for this prophet who's going to Assyria? A giant sea creature comes and vomits him up onto the land, and then he says, I'm going to Nineveh to proclaim their destruction. Everyone who worshipped Dagon would be going, oh no, this is legit. I think it is very unlikely, very unlikely, that Jonah reached Nineveh before his message did. I think this went on every trade route. I think it went forth before him. A giant sea creature vomited up a man who is going to Nineveh to tell them of their destruction. And I think probably the people in Nineveh were hearing this story before Jonah ever appeared on the scene, and they were like, yeah, right. Some guy, that's a great, that's a good story. And then this bleached, hairless man shows up and is explaining to people what God is about to do. The message is delivered. Look at Jonah chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk, and that's, that means it's a three day walk across. So very big city. Then Jonah began to go through the city on one day's walk and he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Underline that. What is Jonah's message? Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. If I ask you, what is the message Jonah brought to Nineveh? Most of you would probably say, well, he called them to repentance. Did you see that in the text? Jonah did not call them to repentance. 
Jonah spoke the word of the Lord, and the word of the Lord toward Nineveh was, God is going to destroy you in 40 days. You will be overthrown in 40 days. Now, if you don't understand this, you've probably not understood why Jonah decided to flee initially from God. This message was the message that God had for Jonah to deliver. Look at Jonah. Flip over to chapter 4. Let's look at verse 1 through 3. Now, spoiler alert, the Assyrians repent, and God relents, and Jonah's upset. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while still in my own country? Isn't this the argument we had before I ever even tried to run from you? Isn't this what I said to you? Therefore, in order to forestall this, because I didn't want this thing to happen, for me to proclaim destruction to a people you weren't going to destroy, because of this, I I knew that you were gracious, I knew you were a compassionate God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better for me than life. Guys, what do Israelites do to false prophets? What are they commanded to do? Stone them to death. The word to Jonah was go and proclaim destruction to the Assyrians. And Jonah said right there, he said, I didn't want to do this because I knew you were going to do a turnabout on this and you weren't going to destroy them. Do you realize that when Jonah preached this sermon that Jonah probably forfeited his right to be a prophet in Israel? I knew that you were the kind of God who relents. God's mercy in this instance, is going to destroy Jonah's credibility as a prophet. And I think Jonah knew it before he ever ran. So what happens to Nineveh? Nineveh repents. Flip back to chapter 3. Let's look at verse 5 through 9. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. They called a fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. He issued a proclamation and said in it, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man nor beast nor herd or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Do you remember how I described the Assyrians? You see what these people are saying? Violence is in our hands. We see who we are as God sees us, and we've got to turn away from it, and they repent. Verse 9, who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Whose whose idea was it for the Ninevites to repent? The Assyrians. Jonah did not call them to repent. The king and all the people said, we've got to turn from our wicked ways. It was their idea. Have you ever known somebody who won't do anything unless it's their idea? Don't look at your spouse. (laughs) But the wise person will lead that person. They'll go, hey, look, here's what's going to happen. 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. And the king goes, you know what? Maybe we can turn this God's wrath away. Let's all repent. Let's change our ways. Now let's return to the prophecy that God made Jonah speak. What did Jonah declare? Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Was that a false prophecy? Verse 10 says that God saw their repentance and he relented of the calamity that he declared to bring against it but the specific prophecy still ends up being correct. What was the prophecy? 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Nineveh was overthrown. God conquered and his word conquered in that territory. These people repented and they became someone different as a result of that prophecy going forth. Jonah is resurrected, but Jonah is wrestling, and you should identify very strongly with this. Resurrected, but wrestling. Are you angered by God's mercy? Let me ask it this way. Who do you want to see go to hell? Think about that for just a moment. What kind of person do you not want to be saved? Does God's mercy ever frustrate you? Now, you all know, and I know, I do not deserve salvation. Amen? You know that you don't deserve salvation. Amen? 
Only a few of you said amen. The rest of you deserve salvation. But sometimes you look at other people and say, look, I don't, I don't deserve salvation, but they really don't deserve to be saved, right? God knows the heart of Jonah, and so now we've had a recalling, we've had a re-recalling, and now we're going to have a re-re-recalling. Jonah chapter 4, verse 4, the preaching of a plant. The Lord said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry? Now look at how Jonah answered God. He doesn't. He does that huff thing, like that whole, we're not talking right now, right? It's like, I'm not going to respond to God. Do you have good reason to be angry? And Jonah says nothing. Look at verse 5 through 9. Then Jonah went out from the city, and he sat east of it. He didn't answer God. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you, God. But God appointed a worm. When dawn came the next day, it attacked the plant, and the plant withered. But when the sun came up, God appointed a scourging east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul, saying, Death is better for me than life. Please kill me, God. God's going to have his question answered. Did you notice God appointed a great fish, and then God appointed a plant, and then God appointed a worm, and then God appointed an east wind? God's making everything happen so that Jonah is going to learn a new lesson. Jonah chapter 4, verse 9 through 11. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry? Wait a minute, we just heard that question. But now he's going to apply it to something else. Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he, that is Jonah, said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work? which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. Now, we look at people sometimes, and you look at them, and, and you see people who are exceedingly wicked in our culture, and you think, what's wrong with that person? They don't know the difference between right and wrong. They don't know the difference between their right and left hand. And the same God is looking at the same people going, they don't know the difference between their right and left hand. They don't understand their own destruction and what they're doing. Can you not have mercy as I have mercy? Can you not see a people who are desperately wicked who need salvation? I imagine this particular story felt almost incomprehensibly strange to Jews in the Old Testament. I want you to think about this. Imagine you're one of the Pharisees in Jesus' day reading this text. What do you see in this story? The prophet of God is like, nah, I don't want to do it because you're merciful. I'm going to run away from God. And then he gets caught running away from God. And who does the righteous thing? A bunch of Gentiles. And God seems to appoint its salvation to these Gentiles and they hurl Jonah into the water and God preserves Jonah and sends him back to this group of Gentiles, people we know God can't care about because they don't know their right hand from their left. And yet Jonah goes forth to these Gentiles and Jonah is angry and he preaches a word from God that doesn't look like it comes to fruition. But what happens? A whole city full of people who are supposed to hate God repent and they're saved. This is a story about the person who's supposed to be godly going over and over again to the people who are not supposed to be godly. And the people who are not supposed to be godly are the ones who change. This story would be incomprehensible to a Jew apart from Christ. When you hear the gospel message, when you see what Jesus did on the cross, not only does this story amplify, this story is Jesus' story of death, burial, and resurrection in the Old Testament. And it's also your story of death, burial, resurrection, and baptism and obedience to Christ. But I bet it was very significant to people like Paul and Barnabas. People who went, yeah, the Messiah has come, but I mean, it's for the Jews, right? Can you imagine them reading the book of Jonah again? 
and seeing as the person of God in the wake of the resurrection, the person who doesn't want Gentiles to be saved is still sent forth to the Gentiles, to the nations. In conclusion, was Jonah wicked? I'm going to ask you a very important question, and it's so important that I would encourage you to do this. If you have your Bible open, go to the front, front of the book of Jonah, and right underneath the word Jonah, I want you to write this question. Who wrote the book of Jonah? The traditional Jewish take on this book is that Jonah himself wrote it. In fact, I think you'll if just think about this for a moment. There is no one who could have known all these details other than God and Jonah. Jonah really is the only candidate of an individual who could have possibly written all the things that happened in this text. According to Jewish and Islamic traditions, from the region in which this took place, Jonah lived the rest of his life in Assyria. And you know, that makes sense, especially if he was worried about going back to Israel and being accused of being a false prophet, because no Israel, no per- Israelite at this time would have considered what Jonah did a virtue, because it looks like what Jonah did was Jonah granted mercy to a people group they hated. This all makes sense. Would you write these things about yourself? Would you? Even if you knew, even if you knew that you'd learned your lesson at the end of all things, would you write these things about yourself? I wouldn't want to. But what if the God of this universe said, you're going to write down exactly these things and in this way, because for generations I need people to see their story in this story. Make yourself look like the villain. Let everybody know what was going on in your head. I want you to see this from a Christian standpoint as we're wrapping up. The protagonist tries to run from God and God's calling and God's judgment. Just like you did. The only way forward when you realize who you are and who God is is for you to die. A death submerged in water. That water becomes to you, Sheol, the grave, a death in which this man, this individual, and just like you, experiences a baptism, not just a baptism, a baptism of repentance, where I go down and I repent, I am transformed and become something else, born again. And just as the prophet is transformed and comes forth not just alive, but committed to obedience, so a resurrected Christian comes into obedience of God. This representative of God now goes forth in obedience, and this messenger of God warns of God's instruction and of God's destruction. A part of him does not want the wicked to repent. He doesn't want God to give others the same mercy that he has been shown. Did that part of the story come across as ugly to you? It's supposed to, because there's part of you that's doing that too. God's calling to us yet again today is to hear with spiritual ears the story of Jonah and to have a heart like God's that earnestly desires the salvation, the salvation of everyone even those who do not know their right hand from their left. Let's go to our master in prayer. Our Lord and God, thank you for the sign of Jonah. Thank you for the significance of this story and its bearing on us as New Testament Christians. Thank you for the understanding you bring us from stories, uh, this particular story. And I pray, Father, that we will all walk away from this place doing as you called us to do bringing mercy and grace to those who don't know you, the same mercy that we've received. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.